Dear ladies and gentlemen, I think what we see tonight um, could be called a packed house. So, Grüß Gott and welcome to the representation of the state of Baden-Württemberg to the European Union. My special welcome and appreciation goes to you, Ms. Rebecca Harms, MEP, for initiating this event. Let me also welcome your fellow MEPs who are with, with us today. I'm pleased to welcome the outstanding speakers who will be part of tonight's event. Please allow me to mention specifically Mr. Claude Thomas, the Minister of Energy and Spatial Planning of Luxembourg. Welcome. And I think he's not yet with us tonight, uh, Klaus Töpfer, also former minister, former executive director of the United Nations Environment Programme, and now chair of the committee that accompanies the search in Germany for a nuclear waste management site. A welcome also to Minister Sabatiene, Deputy Energy Minister of Lithuania. Dear guests, last year in November 2018, the European Commission presented its strategic long-term vision for a climate-neutral European economy. This strategy aims to show how Europe can lead the way to climate neutrality by investing into technological solutions empowering citizens and aligning actions in key areas. Amidst the ever-increasing electrification of the European economy and society in the next decades, the European Union and its member states have to propose solutions that satisfy, that satisfy all. A climate neutral, a cost efficient, and a sufficient supply of energy. In the strategy, the European Commission declared that by 2050, basically all of our electricity, electricity has to come from renewable energy sources. Within the scenarios described in this long-term strategy, nuclear energy plays an important role for the European energy system to reach the decarbonisation goals. This approach taken by the European Commission has reopened or refired, perhaps, to say, because I think the debate has never been really closed, the controversial discussion over the benefits and uh, the downsides of nuclear power for the energy transition in Europe. It will surely also mark today's discussion. Is nuclear power indeed an asset for the decarbonization path, or, on the contrary, is it a barrier for the energy transition? The government of Baden-Württemberg has a clear position. It supports the energy transi transition, that means the decarbonization efforts such as requested by the Paris Agreement. Moreover, it equally supports the second energy transition, that means the German Energiewende aiming, aiming at the exit from the nuclear energy. The reasons, I think, are all known to you uh, in this house. The risk of a nuclear catastrophe is a real threat and not a fiction. 25 years after Chernobyl, the accident in Fukushima has proven this again. Secondly, the danger of a nuclear incident does not end at state boundaries. It would also affect neighboring countries to the same extent. And lastly, the use of nuclear energy has a major long-term implication with respect to the management and to the disposal of nuclear waste. All these elements are also reflected in the coalition agreement between the Green and the Conservative parties in power in Baden-Württemberg. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I trust all those questions, questions will mark the debate tonight. And there are obviously much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable people in the room and on the podium uh, than I am. So I stop here, I open the floor and pass it on to you, Ms. Harms. Thanks for all for being here and have a very good evening. Thank you. Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Rebecca, dear Claude, dear Mr. Lehmann, dear friends. On behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, I would like to cordially welcome you to today's conference. I have been head of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's Brussels office since January 2019. So, I'm a newcomer to this city. <laughs> I'm agreeing, yes. However, um, however, the issue of the following discussion is not at all new to me. When Rebecca Harms and Michael Schneider 
asked me a few months ago whether our foundation would like to co-organize this debate, I did not have to think twice. I have had the honor to cooperate with them for several years now, mainly in my role as head of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's Prague um, office until the end of 2018. I highly appreciate, Rebecca and Michael, your work, and I would like to thank you for your long-standing efforts and valuable contribution to a fact-based debate on nuclear industry developments in and outside Europe. We are very pleased to be partners of this joint event with the Greens European Free Alliance, and we are also pleased to support the World Nuclear Industry Status Report. This remarkable, remarkable report is a reality check which ex explores the global challenges the nuclear power industry has been facing for decades. It is based on hard facts and demonstrates the overall shrinking role of nuclear. And I have to mention, given the available information, given the economic, environmental, and security risks of nuclear power, it is not only surprising, but it is also irresponsible that there is still a political will within the European Union <laughs> to invest in this technology of the past, this technology which is associated with unsolved issues like nuclear waste disposal. We believe that the data provided by the report helps decision makers to understand that investments in nuclear power are not the right way forward. The report shows another very positive, very promising trend, namely <coughs> that the global support for a renewable-led energy transition is high. I would like to thank the speakers of this evening for sharing their expertise with us, and I would like to thank um, you all, actually. Here are a lot of partner organizations of the Heinrich Böll Foundation from all over Europe, we are overwhelmed by the interest um, in this event. It's great that you are all here. And of course, last not least, I would like to thank the representation of the state of Baden-Württemberg to the European Union for providing its premises for our joint event. I'm looking forward to our discussions and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's quite a pleasure uh, to open uh, together uh, with uh, the uh, representative of the country of Baden-Württemberg and with uh, Eva van der Raagt uh, this evening. Um, the idea was a bit uh, based on a very good cooperation I had with the Prague offices on nuclear and energy issues uh, to face Eva van der Raagt in and to face me out. So um, <laughs> I, I hope uh, we will uh, manage uh, to make uh, this uh, experiment a successful one. Uh, I have uh, really um, the honor uh, to welcome uh, very renowned uh, speakers. I will uh, introduce uh, the speakers uh, later on. But I'm also very pleased uh, to have here uh, so a very experienced former colleague from the European Parliament, Claude Turms, meanwhile as a minister responsible officially also for the nuclear issues in Luxembourg. Um, I think uh, also this helps me a bit uh, to give up my uh, so far responsibilities in the European Parliament because I know there is a man in the council uh, who takes uh, care. It's also very good. Um, it's also very good uh, to have uh, Minister Zabai Tiene here this evening. Uh, we went through a major exercise together. Uh, while I was working officially for the European Parliament on my last uh, report uh, concerning nuclear. Uh, but let's start in the right ranking. So many years uh, before I became a member of the European Parliament, 
um, to be precise, in the year uh, 1986. I took for the first time responsibility for a report in the European Parliament. As an assistant uh, to a Green member of the European Parliament, Undine von Blotnitz, I was drafting the report on the Chernobyl uh, fallout impact on the member states of the European community. It was not uh, the Union. Um, so uh, this was 1986. Now in 2018, I was responsible uh, for the report uh, on the uh, decommissioning funds uh, for the decommissioning of uh, the nuclear power plant uh, Ignalina in uh, Lithuania. This uh, so was the reason for the very, very close and very fruitful uh, cooperation uh, with uh, Minister Zabaitiene. Um, I will not go to the details now of uh, this uh, work I did, uh, but I think uh, that uh, so it's a very good uh, sign that tonight we have here guests from 26 countries. Uh, we have not only people representing uh, EU member states, but we have also people representing New Zealand, Uzbekistan, Taiwan, the United States, Canada, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, how comes? Uh, how comes that people representing uh, NGOs, uh, representing authorities, watchdogs, embassies, uh, also governments, uh, that they join us? I think um, in spite of uh, the belief that um, many share nuclear is not anymore an issue, it's an issue. And uh, I'm proud that I could, could connect uh, during the last 15 years here in the European Parliament with many people who seriously work on the issue of nuclear energy, who seriously either stand uh, for the idea which I share, it's good to face out, or seriously try to improve security and to have exchange on uh, security. And um, I hope that uh, also uh, with this evening and the workshops, not public workshops, which we are organizing tomorrow in the European Parliament, we will be able uh, to give uh, a future to this kind of networking, uh, which uh, we exercised, uh, Claude, me, and some other colleagues in the Green Group during uh, the last years on this issue. I think it's extremely important and there was one moment during the last months when I got doubts uh, about uh, my decision to become a pensioner after the next elections. This was the moment when the European Commission uh, put um, nuclear energy officially uh, into the catalog of instruments to fight uh, to fight global warming, so made it uh, a, a part of the strategy plan of, uh, a, of fight against climate change of the EU, but so decisions are made. Uh, what I would like uh, to guarantee is to take care uh, to hand over the experiences and the connections uh, which we have developed over the last uh, 15 years, with some of them uh, the cooperation lasts even longer. Um, I'm uh, extremely pleased uh, that we have again uh, the possibility to introduce to you uh, tonight uh, the result, uh, the, um, the, the uh, result of the ambitious work of one um, of a very unique man, uh, Michael Schneider, a friend and an expert uh, from uh, Paris. Um, I met him while I was preparing uh, the, the draft report on Chernobyl impact uh, in 1986 in the European Parliament. I met him in New York for the first time. But since 1986, we are cooperating. And the report he's going to present now is uh, the result uh, of our uh, discussions how we could um, counteract the narrative of the nuclear renaissance. Because this narrative is strong, it's successful, but uh, it's uh, nowadays we would say fake news. Um, the report started as a small project. It's uh, meanwhile 
So it's uh, so I I think it's uh, the report which uh, gives uh, reference is the reference for many people who are interested to check facts on nuclear development, especially uh, the comparison in between nuclear development, nuclear power development, and renewables is. Uh, the topic of this report. Thanks to uh, so Claude Turms and many colleagues in the European Parliament, so far we could contribute uh, very often to this report financially. Heinrich Böll <coughs> Foundation is a very reliable partner. Uh, other partners are in, uh, but uh, I would like uh, to dare to say also to those newcomers in the European Parliament whom I see here in the audience, um, please take it serious. This has to be continued. And Michael, you get now the floor to present uh, the last, uh, the actual, not the last, the actual <laughs> World Industry Nuclear Status Report. Welcome with me, Michael Schneider. installation here. Uh, while I'm doing this, um, wow, uh, thank you so much for this um, uh, introduction. I mean, this is, this is pretty amazing uh, assembly here of colleagues, of uh, friends, of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people that have been actually connected uh, to this project uh, for a long time. Because it's quite obvious that y you don't, m you know, do something like that alone. I mean, it takes a lot of people, a lot of work, a lot of uh, combination of efforts. And I'm pleased that uh, not only people who have been supporting this project for a long time, like Rebecca or, or Eva, like Heinrich Bill uh, Foundation in, in various countries, but also we have like three authors, I think, in the room, uh, uh, co-authors, uh, Ben and uh, Chris Christian uh, and uh, Julie and, uh, <clears throat> There's even my daughter who's been working on the, the report is in the room. It's pretty amazing, you know? I mean, <laughs> sorry to take some of my time to say this, but uh, I, I find this really uh, uh, quite uh, amazing also having a lot of colleagues that are in the room that have over the years, years contributed to this effort. Now, uh, and of course, nothing, a report is nothing if it's not being hosted um, and if it's not, uh, uh, brought out, and so thanks very much to the, the hosts of this uh, of this evening uh, and the efforts to you know get this report out and make it a reference for debate. This is the role of this report is to be a carpet for debate and a carpet that cannot really be uh, uh, put into question because you know every time there you know we're always happy to correct errors so. And then let's go on from there and base debate uh, on this. Um, so let's l jump right into it because I've heard that I have uh, relatively little time. Uh, this is the first indicator. This is multi-indicator analysis. We have upgraded some of these data to the 1st of uh, uh, January uh, 2019. Here we have reactor startups and shutdowns. And uh, the thing which is uh, quite visible is this huge amount of startups in the 70s and 80s, then this flat development and the outstanding role of China over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, so we have had in 2018 uh, of nine startups, uh, seven in China, two in Russia. If we look at the same graph, same logic, startup shutdowns for the European Union, it looks like this. Um, so we basically, there, there is basically a finished uh, situation by uh, uh, 2000 uh, with hardly anything coming online. The last reactor that started up in the European Union was Chernavoda. Uh, um, that's already uh, over 10 uh, years ago. If we look at uh, reactors uh, operating, cumulative numbers of operating uh, reactors, we see, see this increase until the end of 1980s, flat development, 
And then we see this effect of uh, Fukushima uh, after 2011. We do see an increase over the past five years of the numbers of uh, reactors. Very small, it's very small, but still. Uh, however, the total number now, 416 uh, reactors, um, uh, is to be compared what we already had 30 years ago. So we're still below the number that was actually achieved already three decades ago. Same picture for the European Union. So we see that the, whereas we had the same kind of development until the, 19, the end of the 1980s, it, it was the absolute peak already then. And then it has been going down uh, pretty much ever since. Uh, and we're now looking at 126 reactors uh, in the European Union compared to a peak of 177. Now, if we look at uh, next indicator, uh, electricity generation by nuclear power plants, uh, it peaked in 2006, which is also well below, uh, well before uh, uh, the Fukushima event actually kicked in. And we, uh, we, we see also that the share of nuclear power has been decreasing, continued to decrease uh, ever since 1996, and now it stands at around 10%. Uh, if we look at the same uh, picture and we look at the role of China, we realize that over the last three years, uh, going up to uh, 2017, we don't have the numbers yet for 2018, you see that uh, the three uh, years, last years, were actually only increasing because of the China effect. If you take China out, the rest of the world has actually been decreasing generation of nuclear power. Um, who is generating power? Uh, typically, the, the two top countries uh, uh, generate about half of the nuclear power in the world. Uh, the top five now, US, France, China, Russia, and South Korea, generate about 70%. Um, Nuclear construction is obviously an important indicator, uh, even though, as you see here, we have taken, uh, we have highlighted the, the reactors that were under construction at a certain moment in time, but have not been uh, connected to the grid. This is, this is an effect actually, which was uh, very significant in the 70s and the 80s, but it has not completely disappeared. I mean, the late last reactors we've seen was in the United States when in 2017 they pulled the plug on the VC summer uh, reactors after having spent $5 billion. So that we have now sitting there a $5 billion uh, technological construction museum. Um, that's a lot of money just to, to sit there and without being productive. So it's, it's a phenomenon that people should keep in mind. When, when we read that a reactor is under construction, it doesn't mean that it's actually generating electricity at some point. Historically, one in eight reactors, one in eight, almost eight, uh, almost a, a hundred reactors have been abandoned during the construction uh, uh, at various stages from 1% to 100%. Uh, sorry, and the, the other thing that is important to see after having increased for a number of years after a, a historic low that you have to go back to the early early years of nuclear power development, uh, around 2005. It has gone up to 68 uh, in 2013, but has been decreasing again uh, ever since. So uh, at the 1st of January, uh, we're looking at 49 construction projects. Who is building? Well, China, there's no, no surprise here that China is really the dominating uh, 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 builder. Uh, this is the middle of the year, not able to update all of the numbers and figures yet, but uh, to give you orally, under construction, four reactors have actually started up since the middle of uh, 2018, uh, and uh, we are looking uh, at a couple of uh, um, new construction starts, including Hinkley Point C, and <laughs> this is actually, I just want to leave that in the room, but isn't it amazing how many uh, big 
you know, front page news articles have been published about the Hinkley Point C project. And when it actually starts uh, official construction, nobody writes about it, nobody talks about it, nobody even notes it. Uh, I don't know why, and I'm really puzzled by this. If some people have some ideas why that is so, I would be very glad to learn about it. Uh, one of the other uh, parameters to take out here is that you see a lot of these reactors uh, are late. The construction has been delayed many times for many projects, and we are talking, if we talk of delays in general, we're talking uh, 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 years. We have in the European Union uh, Slovakia, it's been under construction since 1985, so that makes a few years construction for such a project. Uh, but we also have in Finland and France now projects that have been under construction for over 10 years. Uh, this is important, we do this every year. We look at how many reactors have actually started up over the past decade. So just keep that in mind if people show you some scenarios that say we will be building 150 or 200 or 250 reactors over the next decade. This is what reality is. I don't know what will be built in the next decade, but I know exactly what has been built over the past decade. So that should be the baseline. That's the whole idea here. So we have, had, we have seen 55 reactors coming online, and the construction time, the average construction time has been 10 years. That's the sort of the ballpark, uh, you know, uh, average. Obviously, we have a range which is pretty consistent uh, between uh, four and over 40 years. So I think the 40, over 40 years is the U.S. project that will remain the record holder for quite some time. <laughs> now, construction starts of reactors in the world, which is obviously an important indicator, even if they don't necessarily see the light or the end of the construction. Uh, and uh, again, we really clearly see here uh, the, the role of China. Uh, however, it's remarkable. There is no yellow, there is no Chinese project since December, uh, since actually uh, December 2017, but that was a sort of a test reactor, no commercial reactor. So the last construction start for a commercial plant we've seen in December 2016. Everybody has been puzzling what's going on in China. I've been to China in December. Nobody knows. Uh, it, the industry people, everybody just basically says, well, we're waiting from a decision of the top central government. Now, last week, we have seen, uh, uh, or even earlier this week, there was a reporting that uh, there has been a decision to uh, go ahead with four Hualong One, like Chinese uh, type uh, reactors. But this is media reporting. We have no details. No, there is no sourceable uh, uh, information here yet. But it's interesting to see that uh, these construction starts have been going down too, from, from 15 uh, pre-311 to 5 uh, uh, in 2018 and 2017. This is how it looked like the same idea, construction starts in the European Union. So, I mean, that, that pretty much stopped a long time ago, ex with the exception of uh, Olkiluoto 3, Flemoville 3, Finland and France, and HPC, Hinkley Point C, in the UK in December 2018, uh, the construction start that nobody wants to notice, for whatever reason. Now, no construction or few construction means the average age gets older and older. So we're, we're having now, this was uh, mid-2018, mid, uh, uh, reaching 30 years, so we're now at an average age of over 30 years. Uh, but we should stress here that a lot of these reactors, over 60%, have now operated uh, for 41 and, uh, years and more. So this is really a different technological age, right? We are talking uh, uh, reactors that have uh, started operating, so grid connection in the 1970s, it means they've been built sometime in the early 70s, designed in the 60s, right? So that's the technology that, you know, 60% of these reactors represent. And, and, and please take it with a pinch of salt if you hear, yeah, but we have modernized this up to state of the art. You can modernize a lot of things, but not everything. And the question is, what can you not uh, update? 
But that's, this report is not about that issue. So we're just, just you know, think about what that means. And that can, you know, then, then we can debate about it. This is the same picture on uh, the European Union. So if the world average is old, uh, the European average is even older. That's basically the only short uh, message uh, you can, uh, I want to leave here. And it's, it's six months older, so it's now the average is uh, uh, 34 years. I'm going to jump a couple of slides, because otherwise I'm going to get some angry uh, comments here. So um, we, 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 have, we know that uh, we're in the middle of an energy revolution. And this is one of the key, uh, key slides for me. This is Lazar Bank that, that has been uh, publishing for, for the past dozen years uh, these calculations of uh, um, uh, levelized costs of electricity generation. And you see that, you know, solar until the end of 2017, solar decreased between 2009 and end of 2017 by 86%. Uh, wind by 67%, two-thirds, um, and uh, even gas uh, is, you know, has decreased significantly uh, um, uh, generation costs. The only, the only curve that has been going up is, is nuclear power. Uh, so what comes out of it? Uh, it means that a massive investment has been done in, in these areas. This is the capacity added uh, since 2000, and this is the production. Um, I'm, I'm going fast, so uh, if, you have, uh, if you have questions, we can come back to this. This is the capacity added in the EU and the generation uh, in the EU uh, since 1997. Why? Because that was the signature of the Kyoto Protocol. So it's interesting to look historically what has actually the different technologies, what have they contributed to uh, uh, climate, uh, low, so-called low carbon, don't nail me on the on the expression, uh, so-called low-carbon uh, uh, technologies. And you see the, the decrease of, of nuclear here versus the incredible increase of solar and wind. Uh, we have here the absolute figures. So this was the, the added or the differential. These are the absolute figures. And we see that, that now so installed solar has bypassed installed capacity uh, of nuclear. Uh, of course, it's not generating yet as much electricity, but it's catching up very fast. Um, we see the, the, uh, over the past decade, uh, renewables, non hydro renewables have added more than 3,000 terawatt hours, uh, whereas that's about twice as much as fossil fuels, gas and, and coal. It's about three times as much as hydro. Uh, and uh, the differential with nuclear is um, that you know, nuclear contributes less than a decade ago. Uh, this is the situation in China. Uh, we actually thought that nuclear might take over again. Nuc uh, wind is generating alone more power uh, than um, uh, nuclear. And we thought, well, with the big construction, you know, seven reactors coming online last year, this might uh, switch again, but as far as we've seen, the, the numbers for 2018 confirm uh, that wind alone continues to generate more power alone, with obviously huge increases in solar in, in the past couple of years. This is the same picture for India, uh, which people might not be paying so much attention to, but it's very significant. It, it basically gets into the same range of development pattern as in, in China and, uh, and other countries. I'm not going to read all this. You can read faster than I can talk anyway, even if I'm trying to make it a bit quick. But uh, I want to take two, two points home here. Uh, the first one is that for a global trend analysis, it is irrelevant whether there is one or two or five reactors being built or not. The question is, what is you know, bu being built elsewhere, and how does it, what's the relationship? And when you see that uh, nuclear added one gigawatt in a uh, net in 2017, and probably one gigawatt in 2018, compared to 257 uh, gigawatts total 
electricity generating technology market per year, uh, then you, know, you get an idea of how much that is. It's not even a percent, it's zero four percent or something like that. So nuclear power becomes strictly irrelevant to the electricity technology market. Uh, and that has implications for when we talk about climate change. The, the, the second point here really is that the turnover is so low that if this was a living uh, species, you know, would, you would, it would, be, would have been on the, on the uh, list of endangered species for a long time, uh, uh, especially since we have now you know, uh, an invasive species uh, in the name of renewable energies. So it's been fighting you know, heavily and the outcome is pretty clear. It's like it's not making it. So it will die out. That is clear. The question is when, under what conditions, uh, whether it's active or passive. Is this like an, a natural uh, phase out or uh, is this uh, uh, you know, a political phase out? But it's very clear that this species will actually go extinct. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So the next speaker after this um, impressing um, presentation on the real situation and uh, not the faked situation of a nuclear development, uh, the next presentation will come uh, from Yves Marignac. Um, Yves um, is also from time to time advising uh, our Green Group in the European Parliament. Uh, he has now taken over the very uh, challenging uh, question uh, to answer. The question is, uh, what, is what makes uh, the French nuclear exception and what is uh, the future of the nuclear exception in France? Please, Yves. Um, yeah, I don't really, I don't know how I'm, uh, I'm uh, I don't have it on the screen, so I don't, I just don't know how I, uh, shift, sorry, oh, this one? Yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to start with a personal note too, uh, just to say that I've started working on those issues uh, more than 20 years ago with Michael as a junior expert uh, in Wise Paris at that time, and I've learned so much from him uh, that it's really impressive for me to uh, talk after you, Michael, but I'm very pleased and honored. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, try to... Uh, mm -hmm. Well, try to go to the next slide first. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, going to uh, tell you about the situation in France and how it is an exception and might stay an exception if uh, things go like the uh, French government instant, intends to, uh, to do. Um, just to start with, but I, I'm sure uh, you all know very much about it, um, the, uh, it, this is just to remind you how France has been historically dependent on nuclear power with, uh, uh, it, it generates more than 70% of our electricity. Uh, we have 58 uh, reactors, one being built. Uh, one operator, EDF, of course, a fully integrated nuclear fuel cycle. I won't address waste uh, and uh, nuclear material man management issues, but it's uh, an important part of the uh, French picture as well. And maybe uh, one important point to have in mind is that after Fukushima, the debate that was uh, uh, very high in France led to a decision to uh, uh, reduce this dependency with an objective of getting down to 50% of nuclear power by 2025, which was introduced in the Energy Transition Act in uh, 2015. Um, Reducing the dependency of France to uh, nuclear power would actually be the right time because like the uh, 
world nuclear fleet, the French nuclear fleet is aging. It's roughly in the same, uh, uh, it, it, in the European average, 34 years on average for the French reactors, but uh, uh, a large part of them are reaching the, or even uh, uh, getting behind the uh, threshold of 40 years, which was the uh, technical, uh, technically meant uh, uh, operation uh, time. Uh, so as Michael said, we are getting into uh, unknown territories there uh, from a technological point of view. And uh, yeah, it would be obvious to uh, start uh, shutting down reactors and uh, phasing down. Um, actually, ten, 10 years ago, the opposite decision was made. EDF, which uh, even a couple of years before that, in 2006, 20, uh, sorry, 2006, 2007, um, intended to uh, replace these reactors by new one, EPRs, uh, when they would reach 40 years. And that was the reason for starting uh, the building of uh, Flamanville 3. Um, in 2008, EDF decided that it would go for a massive life extension of its reactors for financial reasons, mostly. This, was, this came right at the time when uh, EDF was uh, buying British energy in the UK. Um, when it comes to building new reactors, uh, the uh, performance is far from what was expected, of course. Uh, the uh, plan when building Flamanville 3 started uh, was to get it built for 3 billion euros by 2012. Uh, the cost is at least 10.9 billion. That is the official cost right now. Uh, we don't know when it will be completed. We don't even know if it will be completed and come to operation. There's uh, an issue with uh, some uh, welding, some quality of welding, which really uh, puts a question mark on whether uh, this license, operational license, could could be granted. Uh, but yeah, it's. Not only the EPR in Flamanville, the same happens with the uh, old Kiluoto in Finland, and Inkle Point C, which is only started, is already uh, right on track for the same kind of uh, catastrophe, I think. So um, this led the French government to uh, postpone any decision on new uh, buildings uh, by 2021. Actually, no one was uh, expecting any decision right now, but uh, the government seemed to uh, plan to uh, make one as part of the uh, uh, so-called uh, pluriannual uh, energy plan. Yeah, pluriannual energy plan, which is uh, a formal uh, process that is going on right now. Um, and yeah, the government just published its project of PPE and indicated that a decision will be made by 2021, hoping that Flamanville could be completed by then, but uh, this is really uncertain still. Um, this situation puts EDF in a very uh, problematic uh, uh, financial crisis. I mean, the, 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 this shows, and this, this is an EDF graph, which shows on the left uh, the investments for building the existing nuclear fleet. In the middle, the uh, investments for maintaining and uh, life extending the uh, existing one, and on the right, uh, the uh, new investments for replacing the existing fleet by uh, EPR reactors based on optimistic assumptions. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, put together with the fact that uh, EDF is actually a heavily, uh, as a heavy debt, and will have to pay for decommissioning and waste management as well, really tells you that EDF is not in a position to, uh, to uh, manage with the uh, coming uh, costs and the coming needs. And the question should be, what is going to happen with EDF? What kind of industrial uh, uh, plan reorganization do we need and not how to uh, continue with the nuclear program. But still, um, yeah, the plan is to uh, continue. And on top of this financial crisis, I think we are actually facing a systemic crisis with the uh, French nuclear industry because there, there is this financial pressing issue. There is the aging of the uh, reactor. There is 
uh, waste and nuclear materials uh, piling up, and there is a very, uh, very uh, worrying loss of industrial competencies that shows in the EPR, but also uh, on other uh, major works that uh, EDF uh, and uh, Orano needs to uh, implement on their facilities, and also shows in something which is new in the French nuclear scene, which is frauds uh, on a very, uh, very uh, large uh, level and over a very long period. Um, so yeah, systemic crisis, which again should call for phasing, uh, at least phasing down, if not phasing out. Um, the French government plant, plan, this PPE, which I uh, just referred to, is actually uh, proposing the exact opposite. I mean, the plan is, although the government commits to shutting down 14 reactors uh, by 2035, uh, the actual plan is a massive life extension of the reactors, which brings a large number of them in uh, over uh, 50 years, that is the uh, gray area in the middle, uh, and, uh, sorry, um, over 40 years, that is the gray area, some of them over 50 years, that is the orange area, and even possibly some of them over 60 years of operation uh, in the long time. The plan is that by 2035, we would have still 44 reactors operating uh, with an average operating life of almost 50 years. Um, and there's absolutely no analysis of the uh, industrial capacity to uh, manage such a life extension plan. Um, this life extension plan comes with an idea of adding up nuclear capacities that would remain and renewables, because France, like everyone, wants to develop renewables. And the outcome of this is that first uh, we should kind of renounce any uh, effort on efficiency uh, because it's good for this plan that French electric consumption goes up, goes up. And we should plan for massive exports. I mean, the plan is that by 2035, France would export something like 150 terawatt hours and have more than one fourth of its uh, capacity generating for the export. Uh, of course, that would only work if uh, prices are uh, much lower in France than elsewhere in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, that actually means that the prices on the French market would need to be so low that it would not cover the costs of both uh, life extended reactors and developed renewables. So the plan is that to, to stick to the nuclear program and because France denies the need to, uh, for a nuclear sunset policy, the need to really commit to this phase down, the plan is to subsidize massive overcapacity in France to the expense of the uh, European market and I think that illustrates how nuclear could be a barrier much more than an asset when it comes to uh, energy transition. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Avil Verbogen, Professor for Energy and Environmental Economics at the University of Antwerp. And he deals with an issue, I think he has chosen himself, the title. <laughs> it's no, the no, lessons, no, 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 no okay. No, no, <laughs> so uh, but we, we negotiated the lessons okay. of nuclear winter in uh, Belgium. Um, Belgium is really a hardcore issue. Um, I, I don't know a single country in which uh, the phasing out has been decided long time ago and has been repeatedly decided. Uh, but reality is uh, that uh, those uh, reactors which I find 
together with the French watchdogs, extremely problematic, like in Tihange, with the flaw in the, uh, the flaws in the steam vessel, reactor steam vessel, they get uh, easily lifetime prolongation. Yeah. Please, Avil, yes. how comes? Thank you for the introduction, especially saying I was born in Belgium. I've been living all my life in Belgium. And as Rebecca said, yeah, that, that's already fantastic to do. Like Rebecca said, it's very difficult to understand Belgium. <laughs> the decision-making processes of Belgium is like an iceberg. You see one seventh and the other is beneath it. So I'm not proud to be Belgian. However, however, my friends of the Netherlands have huge commissions, meetings, and they made a big energy plan, and Shell was there, and they decided to build three large coal stations in the year 2006. So this was the decision-making in the Netherlands. So what do you prefer? <laughs> the chaos of Belgium or the order of the Netherlands? <laughs> Anyhow, all the Dutch come to Belgium when they want to have a good time <laughs> and to have good beers. But I have to stay to the subject. It will advance. An overview how to spend 10 minutes time efficiently. And I had the choice, either positioning the issue a little bit or read you the latest Twitter news. <laughs> I will give you one Twitter news of last night. There was a debate of the 10 political parties, only 10 for Belgium political <laughs> parties, that are in government and deciding. And happily, nine of them said the phase out must go. True. So they support it. It's only one, the NVA. It's a quite right-wing party, even for Belgium, right, for Flanders, right-wing party, they still defend nuclear. But many people really don't believe that story any longer. Now, second, we will see that Belgium is very deep in nuclear, that we were a very good partner from France, but France became from partner or master. So be careful with French people. Then you should go to the Netherlands. It's better. <laughs> I just will handle two facts, frequently asked questions, and then I stop. Okay? So this is an overview of the Belgium involvement in nuclear power. You see, we are very deep in it. We started very early because we had the privilege of delivering uranium for the first bombs on Japan to the United States, so we were a privileged partner to get the knowledge. We had a reactor like the BR-3, and you see we even worked together with the Germans in Calcum. <laughs> this was our most successful nuclear project. <laughs> yeah, it, it became not critical, so this was a good nuclear project. And a lot of jobs were paid. Yeah. So this is the overview, but you see our, our relationship to France is very narrow, and we are very linked to France, and especially the last line is critical. We don't have a Belgian power company anymore. We only have French power companies, NG and EDF. So all the decisions about Belgium are taken in Paris, and when Belgians go to Paris, they love Paris so much that we always agree. <laughs> yeah, I've seen this. Our minister who signed the shows B1 and B2 contract, there was a lot of opposition, and again, the typical Belgian decision-making wang under the water and so on. But then the minister went to Paris, uh, Minister Eskens, uh, if you still remember, with Knopes, and the thing was done. He came back, yeah, we signed the contract with EDF. Anyhow, why so many stops first frequently asked questions? One minute? Oh, five minutes. I only have five slides. So no. 
No, six. <laughs> they are already old, so there are more failures and more maintenance. By draining enormous cash flows from Electrabel to the Suez conglomerate, less money has been available for investing in the Belgian electricity sector. This happened. Of the decades of collusion among nuclear regulators and plant owners, now we have a regulator, FANC, that evolved to a more independent institute applying the rules more strictly. So maybe it's not too bad that our nuclear stations are out many times because our regulator is more strict than it was ever before because it was before self-regulation. <laughs> and everyone knows how good he is himself, you know. I regulate myself too, but my wife always wants to do it. <laughs> Engie has become more risk averse in nuclear matters. Engie really wants to avoid a serious accident. Engie is very serious about nuclear. They have decided nuclear is out. Nuclear is gone for the future. They will not invest in new constructions. I'm sure of this. That's clear. So, and they don't want a real exam. The frequent stops and problem care provide more relief, in my opinion, than the deception and covering up problems and failures of the past. So, that first question, well, it's better that they stop than that they operate. Yeah? <laughs> some, some of the cash drains on Belgium, I studied this in the 90s, in a Belgian parliamentary hearing. I presented following numbers. In Belgium, it was about one-third low voltage, two-thirds high voltage. Uh, the low voltage and some part of the high voltage was distributed via intercommunals. That's a structure you anyhow don't understand. Uh, I understand a little bit. Direct supplies is 40% direct supplies, but what you see about the profits is that the profits of Electrabel at that time, 94% came via the intercommunals. It means the households, small uh, organizations and small companies, only 6% from the industry. And Electrabel delivered two thirds of the tractor belt profits and all the tractor belt profits went to Suez. So, and Suez at that time was a conglomerate doing quite some business, needing a lot of billions of cash to invest in buying GDF and so on and so on. The second and last frequently asked questions, why do NG and EDF extend the lifetime of three, 40 years old reactors causing problems and considerable costs. It's a lot of problems, a lot of costs. I don't know the real answer, but I just give you some aspects. As long as some money can be reaped, investors continue to extort equipment. If they think we can get a few hundred thousand or millions euros out of it, you continue to use it. Second is that keeping the capacity on the billboard hides the shortage of investments over the last three decades. And the cash drain to France is covered up by keeping them available. Keeping nuclear plants alive holds place in the electric load system diagram for large scale supplies, precluding the call on new distributed supplies. If you, you, everyone knows an electric power system, you know you have to deliver power in the moment, so you have a load curve and you have a base load and so on. And if you can occupy the base load seats, you don't give the seats to renewables. When renewables and nuclear confront each other, it's very easy to turn a windmill out of the wind. And the nuclear keeps that position. Uh, and if now, 
NG is not yet ready with building all the large offshore wind turbines. They want to keep that place in the load for themselves, large scale solutions. Postponing closure, of course, means postponing the abyss of an eternal future of costs without any income. Can you imagine that you, you close and then you only have for decades and decades a project that costs you money, but you have no euro income? That's, that's not an economic business case. Yeah? And the last point is, Psychologically, the generation of the nuclear dream, and I have some friends of mine who are dreaming like this, cannot face the real nightmare of nuclear power. If, if they, that generation must say, we were wrong, all our young idealism, we invested in nuclear power, and now we must state that we were wrong, that we took the wrong life, and you only have one life. And we are pensioned now, and you too. <laughs> so, <laughs> only one life. And that's it, I think. Oh no, this is another slide. No, no, that's gone. It's, I finished. <laughs> I tried to understand Belgium during the last 15 years. I never managed, but I very much liked to live in Belgium and in Brussels. Um, so uh, we have now the honor to listen to my former colleague in the European Parliament, now the Minister for Energy of Luxembourg, Claude Thoms. Uh, not only Minister for Energy, but explicitly also responsible for all nuclear issues. And he has nice neighbors in Tihange and in uh, Catenon. Um, and uh, I think also our minister from Lithuania is interested to know how to deal with this uh, cross-borders uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, she has even a bigger problem with Ostrovitz under construction in Belarus, uh, constructed by Russia. So uh, maybe learning from Claude Thomas new approaches. So I'm uh, extremely pleased to be back in town. Uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca and the Bill Foundation, to uh, make this possible. Um, and, of course, my first uh, gratitude to you, Rebecca. So I think when I was in, in, in the Green Group in the Parliament, we had a very easy uh, division of tasks. I was in charge of growing the renewables, and Rebecca was there to, to basically tackle the nuclear game. And I think we were a fantastic duo. I, I, I think we have done a great job. And with all in a certain sense, um, also this kind of French exception. Personally, I think that the Belgium exception will, will be solved soon. Um, I think we, le let's look back 30 years. Look, Michael, Rebecca, others, uh, Klaus, where were we in the 80s? Uh, no, in, in, in this term of renewables versus nuclear. And, Come on, we have largely won the game. Um, when, we, when we started, uh, there was hardly uh, any wind and solar. And it was much more expensive than, than nuclear. So the, fa the sheer fact that we have been able to massively reduce the costs of solar and wind, I think this is basically the... the the, the, the winning side, uh, which will, and, and we will continue to, to win on that. I was recently at IRENA. You have now 150 countries who, who come uh, once a year together to work on renewables, and, and this show will not be stopped. You build now solar in some parts of the world for not even uh, 25 euro per megawatt. Uh, this is not only half, a Finkley, this is one sixth a Finkley, and, and offshore wind, which is four to five thousand hours a year, uh, now at uh, something between 
45 and 55 euro per megawatt. This, and this will continue. The industrial basis is there. Good, so the one thing where we have, I think, really to, to, to care about is uh, how can we put an end uh, to this kind of insane uh, prolongation of, uh, of, of existing reactors? And uh, at the end of the day, I think, and, and uh, if the elections in Belgium go a bit right, I think the problem is solved. Uh, because if Ecolo comes back uh, and Grün come back to the Belgian government, then I think definitely we will see very quickly big offshore wind tenders and Tiange and, and the other reactors in Belgium will be closed. So I'm quite optimistic about uh, the actual evolution in Belgium. Uh, just uh, uh, and, and, and the young people in Belgium are now really, I think, kicking uh, <laughs> some of the political parties. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic on that. On France, um, I think France is on a, something what I would call almost a suicidal course. Um, and look, um, if you have a prime minister whose last job was being the communication officer of Areva, and if you have a president who was deep, deep, deep in Rothschild financing uh, and organizing deals between ADF and, and British nuclear activities. And in a certain sense, we, sh we, we should not be surprised. But uh, at the end of the day, they expose their own population and the population of other countries to, a, to an enormous risk. And when I'm, you must imagine, my office is in center of Luxembourg on the 15th floor, and every morning when I come uh, to my office, and it's not very misty. I see four towers of Catenon. I see them from my office. They are hardly 10 kilometers away. So it is, it is a real provocation that the country was able to set this at the frontier. And you can imagine, uh, I'm motivated when I get up out of my bed, but <laughs> the moment when I'm in my office, I'm even more motivated. <laughs> Good, so what, um, what do uh, I think, what are the next steps to do? The first thing is we will in Luxembourg now pass a law on a completely different liability regime. To put it short, the cars of the workers of Cartenau are better insured than the four reactors, so which is an insane situation. So we will have, uh, we will do a copy paste of the Austrian a liability law to make it clear that if ever there is an incident in Cotonou that they will have to pay for it. And our big exercise will be uh, to get the, one day the German government, once they are out of nuclear and that soon, to adopt a similar law. Because then the whole financial risk of the French nuclear would be on the French nuclear, on the French government, and not anymore shared between uh, uh, European member states and especially shared also with, with Germany. Uh, the second thing is uh, the reform of the Re Euratom Treaty. New nuclear is so expensive that it only flies if it gets huge subsidies and the whole scandal about Paksch and Hinkley is in a normal law situation this would be ruled illegal but Euratom uh, is creating a, a, a law-free zone for nuclear new investments and that has to stop and therefore we need the reform of Eurotom and I'm really pleased that we have Austria and uh, Mr. Molin is here, Austria leading the show. We are with them. The Danish parliament is now finally getting active again. We have Portugal, Ireland. So we will have a lot of countries going uh, against the existing Eurotom treaty and I think this is a, a game which we have to uh, get well organized and that's part of my mission I got uh, uh, from my, my colleagues in, in government. And the third thing is uh, this um, <laughs> very strange way of EU Commission to model future energy scenarios for Europe. This long-term uh, strategy has again seen what I call the Delphic Oracle uh, from uh, Mr. Capros being paid uh, to do something which is not standing to any transparent scrutiny, you have to know that when EU Commission uh, did their modeling for 2050, 
In their first scenarios, they were not allowed to have more than 64% of renewables in 2050, not in, in 25, in 2050. That was the first attempt of the nuclear gang inside DG competition, in, inside DG Klima, uh, to, to bias the thing. And then, at the end, the deal was um, go to 84% maximum of renewables. So we have a European Commission who wants to be taken serious by member states, by European members of parliament, by citizens, who does a completely manipulated, biased background for the uh, long-term decision, and we have to attack this and to expose this. Thank you very much. So now we have, uh, before we open the second chapter of the evening, we have a short room for questions. Nobody dares. <laughs> yes. Please. There's the microphone. Yes, good, afternoon. good evening. My name is Kareto Gormsen. I'm from Denmark. Um, you, you talked about the different capacities, and the different costs of energy, and the different life expectancies. But I'm just wondering, how about uh, grid capacity, and how do you deal with uh, storage capacities? Because as we all know, wind and solar, unfortunately, don't produce at the same rate all the time. And if you don't use, say, for instance, nuclear, but use coal or gas or oil instead, how will you compensate for that as a minimum in, say, like cool. the short term of 10 years? So just yeah. if you don't have some sort of capacity to deal with it, what do you do? Uh, massively ex in, uh, invest in battery capacity? Look, I think the first thing which, which you have to know is that the hydroelectric capacity in Europe, which is balancing the, the system in the short term, has been more than doubled over the last 10 years. So we have a fantastic, we have a very large volume of hydroelectric uh, pump storage. Uh, the second thing which we organized over the last 10, 15 years is much more interconnection. So the Danish success story, you have in Denmark situations where Denmark has 130% of, of wind uh, and still, and this is possible because you have sent the link with, uh, with Sweden uh, and Norway. The next uh, 10 years, we have sufficient, especially also gas capacity in the system that there's no problem. Um, and uh, you have to, no, no. Yeah, good, but uh, I think the, uh, if, if we, the, the important decision of the last uh, weeks was that Germany is now finally getting serious of getting out of coal. Uh, we, can, uh, we can massively reduce the, the climate uh, effects of our electricity system if we go out of coal and we keep some uh, efficient gas. Uh, and then the next step, the, the, and there is the battery technology is uh, costs are coming down almost as quick as, as PV. That will be a solution. And there is only one, one um, stumbling block, which is the so-called winter flood. These two, three weeks, which you could have in January, February, uh, statistically, where there would be less wind. And for that, uh, we are working on what we call power to gas, these, these issues of uh, in, we, we will have excess capacities, especially of offshore wind, which we will transform into uh, hydrogen, and that will, and we will have a certain number of gas turbines or other turbines to, to then come in. So all serious modeling, and we have several of them, show you that uh, we can do it, and the quicker we go out of nuclear, the easier it becomes because nuclear is, is uh, as, as you mentioned before, is taking uh, the seeds uh, of some of the renewable capacity. So I think all over uh, we can move, and there is this argument that we need nuclear in future, I think is, is definitely, as soon as you look, look to some serious scenarios, is definitely uh, not, not, uh, not a problem. Phasing out nuclear quicker would even ease it. I would like to add that load management also has a lot of possibilities to control the system. So it's a capacity issue, it's an energy issue. And secondly, 
I expect a lot of redundancy in the system. PV will be become so cheap that there will be a redundancy in capacity. So you will have many times the capacity that you really need because it's so cheap. It's like, like with cars. What's the problem of cars? We have too many. Okay. There's one more question. Thanks, Rafael Weiland from NABU, the German NGO. Um, I mean, we heard in the second input that there <coughs> are barriers on the ground and uh, then turning to the political um, level, Claude, you mentioned it, um, the Euratom Treaty. I would like to hear a bit more about it uh, from you. Is there not, I mean, the hope is for European solutions that, that we, we get more acceleration by it and not having only some member states doing a bit. So is there nothing more by the Commission coming out? Is uh, Brexit not helping uh, a push or? Good, I think we will not start discussing Brexit. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, of course, uh, the, the two big in numbers countries, uh, or the three, Germany, it was France, uh, it was UK. Germany is out of nuclear, UK is probably out of Europe. So you have, uh, <laughs> uh, so you have France left. France plus some uh, le much less influential uh, Eastern European uh, countries. So I think the power is tipping against uh, nuclear. Uh, and uh, that's also the reason why we have now a window of opportunity to, to really um, have a well-organized campaign uh, to, to, go, uh, to go against the existing Eurotom, uh, especially on the issue of, of this unfair Uh, allowance to huge subsidies for nuclear, uh, which was made possible. And look, we worked for, for three, four, five years on this Hinkley uh, case. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, it was only by going back, and, and in a certain sense, isn't it a bit surprising that a court is saying that the treaty, which is 55, 60 years old, is, is more important than uh, than actual treaties plus all the laws which has been done, and, and I think we have to, to try to put an end to that. The good thing is that we have a real momentum now, uh, also with member states, uh, and, and I think we will get there. So the, the I think, very important uh, issue is uh, after, um, so I would say, decades of uh, full of debates on Euratom Treaty, Uh, most of those who are working seriously on the treaty are convinced uh, we will not abolish the treaty, but we have to change the treaty. All those who are interested in learning more about our ideas how to change the treaty, please consult uh, our expert, uh, Dörte Fouquet. She just recently finish, finished a study on how to change Euratom so that it fits. Uh, to the needs of uh, energy, system, uh, energy transition and um, so the focus of uh, security for citizens uh, in Europe. So Dörte Fouquet later on in the reception will uh, give you all answers uh, which we discussed uh, during uh, the last months. Yeah. And, and some I of can, you... Yeah. I can take one more question. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca, some of you should speak to Jean-Claude Juncker because he has <laughs> promised since months that uh, he would uh, produce a paper uh, and so I hope he will do it before he is exiting Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's coming back home so you have a good uh, friend to discuss with. <laughs> Please. Yeah. I'd like to uh, ask a question to Mr. Verbruggen. Uh, I'm from the Green Party in Belgium and I know that in Belgium uh, serious uh, research is going on in the Mira project in Mol. And one of the two goals, uh, the two goals they are envisaging is in fact, uh, first of all, the fourth generation nuclear reactors development, but also the diminishing of the half time decay of the nuclear waste. They want to reduce that by uh, issuing, bombarding it with protons and et cetera, to, to in, in fact, to, to, to make it, to catalyze in fact uh, the, the nuclear uh, decay. Do you know what results are coming out of that project? Because it has cost us already a huge amount of money. Um, 
I don't know which results will come out of it. I only know some engineers working there, and they say, I assume it never will work. So this is one point. So when they can shorten the lifetimes, it's not of all the nuclear waste. It's of some isotopes and some actinids. It's just part of it. Uh, the only interest of that uh, huge investment may be for the medical sector, some, some experiments. So you don't so. think that it will not be a solution for uh, getting rid faster of the nuclear waste? Well, the, the point is that Belgium has tried and gone to every country around in the world, and especially in Europe, to get partners for this project, and no country is willing to partner. So this is mostly dangerous, you know. <laughs> if you are a, a good candidate, people want to work with you. And we have now the bill uh, of 1.6 billion, it was first 900 million, and it will go up. And the time when it will start is postponed all the time. So uh, I think it will go until the pension of the champion of the project, and then it's done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just a quick add-on from a, from a French perspective, because, I mean, this, this, what you refer to is called transmutation. It's reducing the uh, radioactivity, long-term radioactivity of, uh, of nu nuclear waste. I mean, it, it's been discussed a lot in France, too. And basically, I mean, there are experiments to apply this to a small piece of one type of radionuclide, not not taking uh, not paying attention to what happens around it and demonstrating this kind of thing is really different from implementing it on the scale of nuclear reactors uh, and with the right balance on the whole nuclear fleet producing waste and so on so and and there's really no evidence that you could jump from these small experiments to this large-scale balanced uh, implementation. Um, in France, the additional news I wanted to give you is that uh, part of this discussion has been focusing on a project named Astrid, which would be a fourth generation uh, fast breeder reactor, which would also, with, in, in the dreams of the nuclear industry, work for transmutation. And Astrid, I mean, the, there's nothing official yet, but the uh, French PPE, which is the official plan of the government, does not mention Astrid anymore, so it looks like this project is politically dead. There's also research on transmutation in X in Aachen. Um, the whole research project there, I think at least huge parts are financed by uh, the nuclear industry, which is not anymore the nuclear industry. Um, but uh, there is uh, activity uh, ongoing uh, because of the despair <laughs> around the nuclear waste issue. Um, so I have uh, the task now to ask you to leave again <laughs> already your seats <laughs> because I have uh, to uh, push a bit uh, so that we are able to open the next chapter. And since it's about nuclear waste, it's uh, maybe a good uh, moment uh, to end this. And you have later on during the reception the possibility to grill all the experts, not only uh, Dörte Fouquet, with your questions. Um, we have now decided uh, to have um, another um, issue on the table for tonight. Uh, this is also partly the result of uh, my cooperation with uh, Michael Schneider on the nuclear uh, industry status report, the global report, because always when we presented it, the more often we presented it in different capitals uh, around the world, uh, one of the first questions from our audience was always, and what about the nuclear waste? And Michael always said, it's already tough work uh, to present uh, every year a good updated version of uh, the uh, industry, nuclear industry status report. We are um, not able to do it. Um, I thought uh, each year about uh, what to do, and um, I then discovered that it's really necessary to do something in addition 
to the old report uh, because I discovered, uh, especially uh, because I'm still deep in the German debate on nuclear waste since I'm at home in Gorleben. Yeah? Um, so I discovered uh, that um, we have not only the new start uh, for a search uh, for uh, a safe uh, disposal, deep geological disposal for nuclear waste, we also uh, reached a moment um, when everybody has to admit our generation will not solve the, the challenge. So we will not uh, witness, probably not witness, the opening of uh, a disposal site uh, in Germany and probably also not in another country. So therefore, I decided last year that it's high time uh, to come together with experts and to develop a waste, nuclear waste uh, status report uh, to have maybe also uh, this kind of reference which can be accepted uh, by most of the people working in the future on this issue. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, I can welcome today a man representing the German Institute for Economic Research, the DIW in Berlin, the research director, Mr. Hirschhausen, who will give us an introduction into uh, the challenge which we are facing, but also a kind of first glimpse uh, on this uh, project uh, which is in the making but not uh, ready to be presented today. Please, Mr. Hirschhausen. Colleagues, friends, uh, dear participants at this event, first of all, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. Um, I'm not quite sure why I got this, this high honor, but I, I guess it's to introduce uh, Professor Töpfer, <laughs> <laughs> whom we owe the, the nuclear closure um, and, and others uh, in, in, in Germany in, in 2011 and other things. But let me um, <clears throat> structure this brief uh, presentation in two parts. One is things that I usually say when I come to Brussels, which is not very often recently, but uh, from time to time. And then the other, <coughs> um, to put the issue really on the, on the waste issue, to which not only your generation, but my generation and the generation of our children will not see the end, because it, it's an issue of the 22nd century. We're still, <coughs> most of us were brought up in the 20th century, so we're in, with this post-war um, <coughs> generation. Our parents were proud to have nuclear power. My father was proud to have nuclear power and said, this will save the world. We're in the 21st century now, <coughs> but the issue that you're talking about and that you're, you're trying to push is an issue of the 22nd century. Um, <coughs> let me add and repeat what others have said that I'm very um, honored to speak in front of people that I've learned a lot during the last years. Michael, uh, Avia, uh, Claude, uh, Professor Töpfer, uh, Dörte, et cetera. So I feel a little bit like speaking to my professors, even though I'm supposed to be the professor. But um, anyway, it's an honor. And um, let's go uh, into the things um, <clears throat> that we're uh, saying often when, when we come to Brussels. Um, first, that, that nuclear power is a very European, very important issue that um, <clears throat> has different aspects, and, and we have this uh, uh, working group that uh, I want to acknowledge, Ben Wieler, who's, who's here, uh, Simon Bauer and Jusra Tolba, uh, that are perhaps in Germany and probably within Europe one of the rare species and, 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 and dying species to be interested in nuclear power. When we go to parties, nobody talks to us because the, the, <laughs> the party is about renewables, right? But, but still, we manage, and I'm, thank you for being here and sharing this with us. Um, <clears throat> let me also uh, do a little bit of uh, publication for a book that we just published um, on the energy, Energie Wende, the energy transformation in, in, in Germany. There's one chapter in there on, on nuclear power that Ben <coughs> co-authored. 
And uh, this is an issue, and is, it will remain an issue. Um, <clears throat> the World Nuclear Industry Status Report has been mentioned. And um, now my task, I think, is to introduce the uh, glimpse of the World Nuclear Waste Report. But um, <clears throat> putting this into context and kind of repeating what, what, what Claude was saying, um, <clears throat> and also Michael has been saying for, for decades now, is that nuclear power in the European energy mix, and we spent uh, a week uh, in November in the United States discussing with people the issue of nuclear as a <clears throat> kind of climate low carbon policy. It may be low carbon, but it's high risk. And um, <clears throat> so we uh, repeated an exercise that had been done in the, in the 80s by uh, Emery Lovins and others and looked whether um, <clears throat> nuclear power can or has ever been economic. And there are two ways to address this. One is to look at every single nuclear power plant that is in the report. And we traced each of these power plants in a report that uh, Ben was uh, leading, um, <clears throat> showing that not a single nuclear power plant has ever been built under <clears throat> competitive economic conditions. And this is in the range of 650 plants. Now, if anybody in this room has any counter experience, as, as Michael said, please let us know. Otherwise, this, this is a truth because it has been shown um, <clears throat> empirically. It, it, it's also relatively easy to show this economically. And the figures vary a little bit, but <clears throat> not only nuclear power is by far the most expensive way to generate electricity. It's in the range of 11, 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Let me recall you that the average wholesale prices these days is about four cents, which is 40 um, euros a megawatt hour. And as uh, was mentioned, renewables go down to 25, probably more in Latin America, but in, in, in Germany, they are now in the range of five, six, seven. But even if the CO2 price was 100 euros per ton, nuclear would still <coughs> be more expensive than coal and natural gas. Um, <coughs> Looking at the literature, and I've been personally going through the last um, seven decades of literature, this has never been contradicted, by the way. There's not a single serious source that would have pretended that nuclear was economic, which brings me to the uh, <coughs> nuclear paradox that has al also already been mentioned. The nuclear paradox in Europe <coughs> is that in the... Um, <coughs> Scenarios for 2050, the, the EU reference scenarios, nuclear always comes up as a low-cost additional um, source of electricity. These figures are from the um, <clears throat> 2016 exercise. They are differentiated between investments in new capacities, 